Good morning. Morning, everyone. Morning, Francesco. Hi, Jeff. I see just few people. Uh, we will wait for a few minutes more for someone else to attend the class. Uh, Hi, Doctor. Hi, all. Some of us are uh, going to the supermarket for preparing the field work. But I think we should soon start, not waiting there. Later, when they use in the YouTube, they will watch. Okay. Just okay. wait for two minutes or like this, then yes. we will start. Okay. Thank you. Uh -huh. in, um, in the meantime, uh, in all uh, these four lessons, uh, that is uh, also the last one that Francesco, we will start in a few minutes, uh, uh, will be, uh, have been actually recorded and uh, already are available on YouTube uh, for anyone uh, interested. I can paste the link here. Okay, in, uh, in the chat, please check if you can manage to reach that page. You will see the first three uh, videos related to the first three lessons. As well, uh, remember that, uh, but Francesco, we will uh, show you something, I think. Uh, you have all the files, all the material we used in uh, for this course in a, in a shared folder uh, on the web. I will repost the the address of that uh, as well in a few minutes. Francesco, I think you can start if you are ready. Or if you have some news from Vittoria, let's wait for her. I think Mavi will uh, join a little bit later. They are getting, her and Claudia and a couple of the group are getting food for the field uh, for this weekend. They should be back any minute, but uh, if you go ahead and start, I think they can, they can jump right in. Okay. 
When okay, we won't, we won't wait for her, Jeff, uh, and you will be the culprit. <laughs> Sounds good. Okay, thank you, Jeff. Francesco, let's, let's start. Okay, so good morning, everybody. Uh, today we will we will see an example what Damiano uh, talked to you on Tuesday, uh, Tuesday afternoon for you and morning for uh, for us. And now I'll start sharing my screen. Okay. Okay, uh, can you see my screen? Okay. Uh, yes, we see. Perfect. Okay. Today we uh, we will uh, talk about distribution modeling using a case study. Uh, actually, uh, we will start from what Damiano. Uh, <laughs> talk to you on Tuesday and we will follow this flow chart uh, this is the uh, the way we will work today and actually is the way we, we work uh, when we um, when we perform uh, uh, distribution modeling so we will work on two different lines uh, with uh, eco-geographical variables, so we will work on, on them and on distribution data. Uh, and then, uh, as you will see, actually, most of the time, we will spend most of the time trying to fix in the data, and then uh, for the modeling, the maximum modeling will be the last part of the lesson and will be the uh, quickest part of the lesson. Uh, so, First of all, we will talk about eco-geographical data, distribution, distribution data. Uh, I, I got an example of um, from uh, your data set, actually. Uh, today we will work on data uh, Sutulum sent to me, uh, that is uh, about uh, red deer. Uh, okay, I will show you where we are, okay. Okay, today we will pass from two different uh, programs, not just R uh, for the modeling, but also uh, to QGIS, that is a geographical information system that probably you already use or uh, I suggest uh, it, it's very useful uh, to create and to work with uh, geographical data and to create map. Here uh, we are uh, in, uh, in Mongolia. You can see in, with the blue line the, uh, the borders. Okay, and this is our and these are the data that I received. Okay, you can see all the um orange dots should be the presence of red deer in uh, in mongolia the data set i received actually uh, i received a csv uh, a comma separated value file file sorry and uh, um, you uh, if you remember what we said during the last uh, uh, during the last classes uh, actually, in uh, R, we can work using uh, every kind of file because uh, uh, R is able to open and to work with any kind of file. What do what we actually need here is uh, the information about uh, coordinates and uh, uh, loading this uh, comma separated value file. Uh, this is what we. Uh, wh what I found in the attribute table. Uh, of course, as Damiano told you on Tuesday, uh, you can have different information related to your to the presence 
uh, of the species you want to model the distribution. In this case, the information we got we were just uh, lat long, so lati latitude and longitude, so the coordinates and the and the the name of the species. Okay. Uh, if you have more information, like uh, for example, uh, age classes, sex classes, or uh, uh, ER, uh, for example, during which you collected the information of the presence of the species or the species, you can actually filter the, your uh, presence data, and uh, you can. Um, uh, you, you can use a part of them to model the distribution and not all of that. As I didn't have any other information, but just the name of the species and the presence, I used all of them, okay? Today we will start with all of them. And then we will see that probably uh, it, it, it was better to, uh, to filter them because not all of them actually are uh, proper data to use for our model distribution. Uh, okay, so uh, this is where we start. Okay, now if we go to uh, R, okay, uh, as you will see, we will have um, three different scripts, okay, as we said, uh, as Damiano told you yesterday, we will process the ecogeographical variable, we will look at the presence. Uh, uh, of the, the data presence, and then we, we calculate uh, a, a distribution model, in this case, using Maxent. Uh, Damiano told you yesterday about the Dismo package, that uh, it is able to make uh, Maxent models, okay? But um, actually, recently, uh, <coughs> most of the recent paper actually uh, use uh, uh, ensemble modeling. Uh, Damiano, yes, uh, Tuesday show you uh, several type of models, uh, general additive models, uh, uh, general linear models, and, uh, and so on, Maxent, and so on. Uh, recently, uh, several, um, several papers uh, report uh, actually uh, um, distribution uh, distribution modeling using all of them so uh, researcher actually uh, calculate several models with different type of models and then they actually uh, perform a kind of average average of these models okay uh, but today we will see just uh, uh, max uh, as you asked to us uh, but remember that uh, um, different techniques in distribution modeling are uh, uh, are coming out uh, uh, day by day. So uh, we will learn how to make this one, and uh, please keep update with the um, with the latest uh, uh, distribution modeling performance. Okay, so let's start from the, uh, we, we, we saw where we are actually in Montoya. Uh, we are talking about uh, uh, red deer, okay, as in uh, most of the script uh, you saw, the first part of the script is uh, uh, prepare your, uh, uh, your desktop where you are working. So we, uh, we start uh, loading the packages that we, that we need in, the, in our uh, uh, during our processing and here you can see line from 20 to 22 that we can load our packages. Uh, okay, something, I, I want to tell you something actually before we start. As you can see in the, in the environment and the top of right of the R studio, uh, you can see there are uh, already a lot of uh, elements, objects, so data and, uh, and function. Actually, there is a reason about that. Uh, I don't remember if we talk about this part uh, uh, during the other lessons, but actually, uh, as we said, uh, R uh, does not uh, save everything on the hard drive unless you ask to write it. 
uh, on the hard drive. Uh, 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 you can actually store an R data uh, file. What is an R data file? Uh, is a file that helps you uh, when you load uh, again R Studio and your script to load the last version of the environment uh, when you closed uh, your your process. Okay, uh, as Damiano told you Tuesday, uh, distribution modeling can can take a lot of time. Uh, depending uh, on the number of uh, replicates uh, we perform of a model, depending on how large is the uh, steady area we are working on, uh, depending on the mesh of the grid we are working on. So we, we can process a lot, a lot of data, a lot of grid and raster data. So it, it, it actually can take a very long time. So we don't have all this time this morning. So I saved the last session of my R Studio uh, working. Uh, and so that's the reason why we have all this uh, information already loaded in the environment. If you start from zero, OK, you will see this environment uh, at the top of the right empty but you can uh, run uh, in the same way the, uh, the scripts, okay? Uh, as uh, um, we, we told to you during last lessons, actually R is able to, to do almost anything. We said also coffee, uh, but um, there is another advantage so using R that is to uh, we we can create our own function. Okay, so uh, here uh, and we will give you these uh, the scripts. Uh, actually, uh, Damiano prepared some uh, function that we will help us to perform to process uh, rasters information. Okay, it's. Uh, it's exactly like uh, loading in other packages, but uh, we are not loading a, a public patch packages, but we are loading something that we prepare by ourselves. Okay, I will show you where the uh, these uh, utilities are. Okay. Okay. This is what uh, uh, Damiano created, it is a commodity function to prepare raster data set for habitat selection. So uh, he created uh, several functions that we can uh, use during our processing. Okay, so we load also this function. And uh, when you load new function in the environment, you can see that you load new function. So uh, there is the uh, data part of, uh, of, the, of the environment, the results you have, the values, and then you have functions at the bottom. OK, so actually we have function with different name and uh, reading the name of the function, you can easily understand what this function uh, uh, do. OK, another important thing that we uh, uh, that we have to do actually when we start working uh, with geographical data, okay, uh, is to set which projection we are working. Okay, Damiano told to you about this uh, yeah, Tuesday. If we go back to our uh, uh, QGIS, uh, we can see that actually uh, we look um, uh, we look at Mongolia with this uh, shape, okay? That's all all of us know about it. And e if you see here uh, at the bottom of the right of the program, you can have in you can read in which uh, uh, EPSG we are working actually. And uh, if you change it, of course, you will see something different. Uh, I never work with uh, uh, EPSG like uh, uh, you sent to me, so I had a big uh, 
uh, it was a bit difficult at the beginning to understand uh, uh, what we what we have to do. OK, so I change in uh, geographical coordinates as you sent to me. And as you can see, the shape of Mongolia is uh, uh, is like squeezed. OK, so it's a lot uh, uh, is a strange shape in the in, in this case, uh, but uh, uh, we do not mind uh, um, if we use all our data, both presence and uh, ecogeographical variable that we will use in the same uh, in, in the same projection. We can do anything we want. We uh, it doesn't mind which projection we are working on. Uh, today uh, we will work uh, in the APSG that we call uh, okay. Let's go back here. Okay, that we call three two six four eight. Okay, and uh, we will fix all our data to this projection. Okay, so first of all we create an object. Uh, a CRS object, okay, uh, uh, where we store our projection, okay. So let's have a look at what does what CRS does. Okay. Okay, this function that you can find in the package uh, arcdal or uh, sp okay uh, can allow you to set the uh, coordinate reference systems okay so if you need more information how to work with this function you can just uh, go to the manual page of the function and you can uh, have a look uh, about it. Of course, as I, uh, uh, as we told you uh, during the other lessons, uh, we must have, uh, with R we can do anything we want, but uh, actually we, uh, we should know what we are doing, okay? So uh, what I, what I remember to you is that we have to set the projection, but you have uh, you, you should know which projection you need to work with. OK, depending on your question. OK, uh, the second step. OK, uh, passing to line 30 and 31. OK, uh, is to set which is the special resolution we are working. OK. Uh, as Damiano told you during the, la, uh, the last lesson, uh, we should work on a grid uh, where every information of all our ecogeographical variables uh, go in the same uh, spatial resolution. OK, so uh, if you use uh, some uh, uh, weather or uh, uh, climatic data, for example, uh, uh, rain, temperature, or anything like that, that has a special resolution, for example, of one kilometer, and we have land cover of, uh, uh, with a special resolution of uh, 100 meters, for example, remember that we must pass to the, uh, uh, to the war special resolution, okay? Uh, in this case, I, I tried uh, several models using your data set, and actually I, I, I didn't realize that Mongolia is so much bigger than Italy and the, our, uh, and the study area where we uh, used to work, actually. <coughs> Sorry. So, uh, uh, what, um, um, I, it took, I, I started with a very low, uh, sorry, very high resolution, so 100 meters, and then I realized that it, it could took uh, maybe one week to perform uh, the, the processing of a distribution model on, on my laptop. So uh, as today is just an example, I set a spatial resolution of 500 meters, 
that is, is still a, a good resolution. And uh, uh, as uh, Damiano told you uh, on Tuesday, uh, actually, uh, we will not work just uh, uh, simply on uh, a land cover, but we will uh, 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 prepare our uh, land cover layers uh, using a particular technique. Uh, that it means that uh, uh, we will uh, not use, uh, I, I pass here, okay, again, let's go back to our red deer presences, okay. And as we are uh, naturalist or biologist, and we have the presence of the of a deer uh, in in this part of the world, of course we know that the deer is not there just because uh, he likes this particular area, but is as the uh, ability and to understand which are the. Uh, situation of uh, uh, its habitat uh, in a much bigger area. So uh, let's imagine that here we have uh, uh, rocks uh, and we got presence of uh, uh, red deer on bare rocks over here. Do you think, mm, you, do you think that uh, uh, your red deer choose this habitat because it's the uh, uh, most preferred habitat? Uh, probably not, because uh, uh, um, red deer can move, uh, can move a lot. They can move for several kilometers uh, each day. So we will want to know uh, which is not exactly the land cover uh, where we have the uh, the the presence uh, we recorded the presence of the species, but we would like to know uh, the percentage of this land cover uh, in a buffer around this uh, uh, this presence point. Okay, so what we will fix and we will work. We go back to art now. Okay, is the radius? Okay, uh, where we calculate the percentage of that habitat cover in that radius, okay? So we, we know the proportion of the habitat in a, uh, in a much bigger area, uh, not just uh, uh, where we have the presence point. Uh, and how do we choose this, uh, uh, this radius? Actually, we can choose it depending on the uh, on the ecology of the species, uh, on the behavior of the species, sorry. So, for example, uh, uh, how many kilometers he works, uh, he can do uh, during one day, and uh, the dimension of the ranges, uh, and, and so on, okay? So, these, we, we are still preparing our desktop, so we are saying, where we with the three first lines uh, where we uh, which is the projection we are working which is our spatial resolution uh, and which is the radius of the uh, percentage maps that we will prefer later okay so if we load and we if we run sorry these three uh, uh, these three lines, as you can see uh, at the bottom on the on the left on the console, there is the pulsing line. It means that everything is fine. And easy, if you read on the environment side, you have your object that is the radius that is 1,000 meters, and the resolution object is 50, uh, 500 meters. Okay. Then second, the, the other step is. Uh, uh, that we will work with several, okay, ecogeographical variables, and we will store all that ecogeographical uh, variables in a in a stack file, okay. Uh, uh, what is a stack file? Actually, uh, is a, a pile of several ecogeographical uh, variables. So we don't do not need, as Damiano told you. Uh, on Tuesday, we do not need to uh, pass every time, every single 
variable covariate that we we are using, but we can pass all of them all together. Okay. Then um, uh, it's uh, useful to load uh, a, a proper uh, study area, a area of interest. If we go back to QGIS, okay, I will show you. Okay, we are here. We are ready presence uh, in Mongolia. Uh, when I started, I was preparing my uh, study area. Uh, here you can uh, see it with the red line. Okay, and uh, then I started to perform the model distribution and the pre-processing of our data set all over this area. But again, uh, it was a, it, it is a very, very, very big area. And so to show you this example, I just uh, uh, create a smaller area, okay, that you can see uh, here at the, at the left, okay. So we will work only on uh, a subset of, our, or of the data of Red Deer present that uh, you sent to me. Uh, so we will able to perform the models during these uh, uh, two hours. Uh, this uh, is uh, the way we actually you can use uh, when you start working in a different uh, uh, with a different data set. Uh, you are trying to uh, to perform some uh, uh, analysis. It could be useful. Uh, if you have a lot of data, you are working in uh, a very large area, as Mongolia is actually, uh, you can start and test your program, your script, on a, on a subset of your data. So actually, if everything works for a smaller sample, and it takes a uh, uh, few times to, per, to perform your modeling and your analysis, then you can when when you are when you prepare so the all your program then you can pass to the uh, to the complete data set and but you already know that everything performs and goes in the right way okay because for example you can uh, spend um, maybe a, a couple of hours preparing your ecogeographical variables all over your big area and then something uh, goes wrong okay so you have to start again but you spend two hours you actually lost two hours trying to work on that if you work in a uh, in a smaller part of your of your area you you got a, a smaller data set maybe you can uh, test your data in 10 minutes and understand easily which is the problem with your data, fix it and start again, okay? So when you arrive and you have all the processing that works, you can uh, uh, load the proper data set and then you can uh, work on and perform your analysis on the complete data set, okay? So here, I load uh, in line 40 and 41. I load the uh, um, the area of interest, the small one that uh, I show you on the map. So let's run uh, line number 40. Okay. As you can see here, uh, we use this function is uh, read OGR. Okay, this uh, allows you to load uh, several type of data and uh, uh, within this type of data, you can load also uh, S3 shape file. Okay, that are the um, most common uh, geographical file that are used to, uh, to share geographical uh, information. Okay, uh, so uh, remember that when you load something, uh, you have uh, your data here. Uh, if you look at the top uh, right uh, in our environment, there is the area of interest, how I here. Uh, it tells us what it is. A former class is a spatial polygons data frame. So we are working 
uh, with a polygon. So an S3 shape file, when we load it in the in the R environment, uh, gets this uh, uh, class that is a spatial polygons. Okay. Uh, so if we got only, uh, we, if we do not have an attribute table, it will be only a spatial polygon. But having a, a, an attribute table, we have the geographical uh, information, the spatial polygon. And as you can see, is a complex object. It's a spatial polygon data frame. It means that a part of it is also a data frame. Remember that last week, We've been working a lot and try to understand how works data frame. So, what with the the loading of uh, uh, S3 shape file data, we can also work in the R environment with the attribute table. Okay, uh, but here we see just a line. Okay, our object. Can we see if uh, is the proper object, okay? In the same way we were looking uh, to it uh, in uh, QGIS, okay? Uh, what what you would try to do to see this object, as you know that is a, a, a geographical object? I would try to plot it, okay? Uh, so if you look at the console on the bottom of the left, I just as to R to plot what to plot our area of interest. Okay. Okay, so you can see on the uh, bottom of the right, this is the, our area of interest. Okay. Does it look like to what we have on our uh, geographical information system? Yes. Okay. So we are working in the proper way. Actually, uh, remember that uh, you cannot do in, in the R environment uh, all the uh, maps perform uh, uh, as you can do in a geographical information system as QGIS, but you can still print some map using also uh, R and some packages that we see uh, later. Uh, let's go on. Let's go to line number 44. Uh, we set our study area. Okay. Now we have to set which is the grid we used to work. Okay. So before we set the resolution. Okay. Now we have the extent of our study area. And uh, we know in which projection we are working with this function that's called raster. Okay, let's have a look at what raster does. Okay, looking at the, man, at the manual page. Okay, create a raster layer object. Okay, it has the, um, uh, the raster layer objects uh, uh, will be the objects uh, where you store your data about a geographical variable. So uh, link cover, uh, link cover data, uh, elevation, slope, or whatever you uh, you need to um, to analyze. So if we run line 44, okay, we cre we created a a raster. As you can see, a reference raster we call ref raster. You can see in the environment at the top of the right, and this file is a, a, a large raster layer, okay? If I just type in the console the name of the raster, okay, let's try. Okay, I wrote the wrong name, sorry, right instead of ref. Okay, you can see what is the this object is. is a raster layer. The, these are the, the dimensions. Okay, the resolution 500 by 500. Okay, a square grid. Okay, this is the stent. Okay, this is the projection. <coughs> so, sorry, when we set our projection to uh, 32648, this is what uh, this is the what we get. 
okay? Is a, uh, we don't have a, a, a name actually of the of the raster, and you can see here in the bottom line we can see value, okay? And uh, actually you can see an A, so not a number because we just create the raster, but we didn't insert any information inside, okay? We don't have any number, okay? We will just use it to set all the uh, raster layer that we will load later to, uh, to this kind of resolution extent and projection, okay? Uh, I left here and then uh, I will give you, of course, this, uh, this uh, scripts to you. I, will, I didn't load it yet, but I will do it as soon as we finish this, our lesson. Uh, uh, as I told you, uh, this kind of processing and analysis can take a uh, uh, long time uh, if you are uh, able to um, to use in a better way uh, your computer. Uh, you can actually uh, use different pros um, uh, different part of your computer to work on it. So you can. Uh, uh, um, you you can use uh, this a, a parallel processing, okay? So you can work uh, in a, in a quicker way on uh, on your computer. We are not using it today. This is a uh, just a, a step forward when you will be able to uh, to already run your uh, uh, your script, okay? So. Uh, from where uh, we start, uh, as you can see, here are actually the, the lines from 49 to 54 are all green because, as you can see, I comment them, okay? But uh, actually, I already performed this line, as I told you before, so I started loading what? Um, digital elevation model, okay? And from digital elevation model, I can get elevation, and then we can see how to get slope, okay? And how to get aspect. Thinking that this could be important variable for our distribution modeling. Of course, if you think that uh, the species you are studying, uh, uh, does not choose a particular elevation or does not choose a, a particular slope or aspect, you don't need to load this uh, and to calculate this uh, uh, ecogeographical variable. Okay, so let's go back to uh, elevation. What I do is to load the digital elevation model. Okay, if you look at line 51, okay, what I do is using again the function raster, okay? This time not to create an empty uh, raster as we create, uh, uh, we created in line 44, but to load a raster, okay? We can directly go on our uh, hard drive and tell uh, R, okay, load this raster, okay? Let's see if we have, uh, this uh, raster, or we download it, okay. No, I didn't, I, I didn't keep the, uh, the, uh, the pre-processed raster, okay. Uh, you will load your, uh, your digital elevation model, and then the other things that you will have to do with all your, uh, uh, ecogeographical variable is to project your raster, line 52, the function is project raster. Let's have a look of what this function does. Okay, project the values of a raster object to a new raster object, okay? So here, what we, which argument we pass to our function? We say the raster, the row, digital elevation model, where we start. 
we say that we want everything to go uh, in the same way of the reference raster that we create. We say in which way, in which resolution, and which is the method, okay? So what we get here is uh, that we create a, a raster uh, of our digital uh, elevation model that has got the extent of our reference raster that actually is our area of interest, our steady area. And if we look at our raster, okay, let's have a look. I already loaded. Let's see if we can see the raster over here. Uh, if you look at line 54, okay, look what I did here. As this these three line 51, 52, and 53, depending on the dimension of your study area, can take several several minutes. Okay, I prefer not leaving everything uh, uh, in, in the non-permanent memory of the computer, but I wanted to write it down to my hard disk, to my hard drive. Okay, so which is the function? to write a raster, simply the function write raster, okay? And as you can see here, the argument that we pass to the function is the, um, the raster that we created and projected. We can give a name. We say in which format we want to write on our hard drive the, uh, the raster. Uh, in this case, I use the uh, geotiff, that means uh, is uh, a, an image with coordinates, okay? So in line 56, now what I did is uh, just load the raster, okay? I prefer that file. I wrote as, mm, as is a very uh, time demanding processing. I wrote it on, on the hard drive and the, uh, on, on the next time you will, uh, uh, run your script, uh, you can just load it and not create it, okay? But the first time, if you want to uh, create and set your raster, okay, you will have to uh, to create the, uh, the raster in the way I show you in lines 49, 54, 53, sorry, okay? So uh, we can see which is our uh, digital elevation model, okay? Uh, if we plot it, uh, you can see that we we go from zero to uh, three three thousand five hundred meters of elevation. Uh, you can see differences uh, looking at the colors, okay? And here uh, you can see also the uh, the reference system and the coordinates, okay? As Damiano told you yesterday, uh, from this raster is a numeric raster. So in every uh, cell of our raster, if we look at it, we have a number that corresponds to the elevation. Okay. If I uh, type on the console at the bottom of the left of the left the name of the raster. Okay. What we have here, we know. DEM, digital elevation model. Okay, we have the dimension, the resolution, okay, the stent, the projection, okay. And when you look at the uh, last line, in the value line, it tells us that it's got numbers that run from zero to uh, 3,800 meters of elevation, okay. So it means that we got values in this raster, not as uh, in the reference raster that we used before that was an empty raster, okay? Starting from this raster, we can actually uh, calculate other kind of raster. Uh, Damiano already showed you yesterday. Uh, you, we can have uh, easily slope, okay? Uh, do, you, do, do you think that slope is important for uh, red deer distribution? Actually, 
uh, I do not uh, I do not very well the situation right there in Mongolia, but uh, thinking about it here on the Alps uh, in Italy, I would say that yes, it would be important because the steepest uh, slopes actually I do not see these species. Maybe I see other kind uh, species of ungulates. Okay. Uh, so uh, I would say that red deer will not use very steep, uh, uh, steep slope. Okay. Um, um, so I, 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 I choose to calculate. Okay. Uh, slope again is like the elevation. Okay. Is a numeric variables. Okay, with real numbers, okay, uh, that goes from zero to uh, 90. Okay, so here you can see that uh, uh, actually we want to create uh, several classes of our slope. Okay, so uh, we will not have uh, any more at the end of the processing uh, a, a raster with number but we will have a raster with classes, okay? So here we said that we, we say that from zero to five degrees, uh, we have uh, the flat part, okay? The level part of the, our raster, then from five to 8.5 degrees, we will have moderate, okay? Eight to 8.5 to 24, we have a strong slope. Over 24 degrees, we have a, a very steep slope, okay? Uh, running line from uh, 68 to 76, okay, we actually create exactly this part, okay, Let, I, I'm not running this uh, uh, right now, okay, or I can actually, let's try to run this, okay, okay, as you can see here, uh, actually, um we got some error because i didn't load in my environment the the raw dem the raw digital elevation model that uh, i used to create the uh, the slope uh, uh, part uh, but there's no problem it's just to make you understand which are the steps then if you run the scripts that i will give you you will pass through it uh, easily with uh, uh, you actually easily, but with uh, uh, you need a bit of uh, uh, a, a bit of time. Um, you will get slope, and as you can see here, from line uh, 78 to line 85, we use a function that Amiano created, that is a make circular filter, and has got two uh, arguments: radius and resolution that we fixed before. Okay, so just remember that we do not want to use uh, just uh, the exactly name of what we have in that cell of our raster grid. Okay, but we want uh, uh, the proportion around the circular part of that uh, uh, of the cell. Okay, uh, it means that uh, uh, it doesn't matter if uh, in that uh, uh, particular cell, we got the information about uh, steep, okay, but if we want to look uh, around that cell, if everything is steep, okay, that means that uh, cell is steep, okay, but if around that uh, we got uh, uh, moderate or uh, strong or level uh, slope, okay, the classes that we set before, we want a proportion of how steep is that. It's, we do not want uh, the right information that is just steep. And this is the way we um, we will work with uh, uh, every uh, ecogeographical variable, okay? As I, uh, I told you before. From the digital elevation model, okay? Uh, we can get slope, we can get uh, aspect, and several other uh, uh, 
uh, information about it. I used to be uh, to be uh, to be a bit uh, quicker and easier. Uh, just these two slopes and aspect, but you can uh, you can derive several other uh, ecogeographical variable from the digital elevation model. Okay, so I uh, calculate aspect. Okay, again aspect uh, is uh, from zero to 360 degrees, okay, is a circular variable, okay, so uh, be careful anytime you will, you will use in your analysis circular variables, they are dedicated analysis because uh, of course you cannot use uh, uh, simple uh, analysis because you don't have a normal distribution because it's not normal, but it's circular distribution. So be careful when you use uh, uh, circular covariates. In this case, again, uh, we transform our uh, covariates in a, a factor. So we say that we in, in different classes that we we create different classes. So we we create the uh, the most common classes for aspect, so is north, northeast, east, southeast, south, and and uh, and so on. Okay, we fix this part, creating a maxi, a matrix. Uh, we create our levels again for each of our cell of the uh, of the raster. Uh, we make a filter and we calculate the proportion of each classes inside the cell. OK, what the, what we do, OK, then we we prepare three different ecogeographical variables. OK, if you look at line 119, we prepare digital elevation model. We prepare aspect and we prepare stop slope. Sorry, OK, with a function stack. OK, you can have several you can uh, Concatenate actually is kind of concatenate, but not with numbers of object, but with a raster file, uh, several raster file in a in a pack of uh, several layers. Okay, so if you run uh, line 119, okay, you can have uh, you can create this object. Let's have a look at what this object is. This as I told you, as this takes time, I already created and loaded it uh, uh, in my environment. If I plot uh, the, the stack that I created, a G E G V, sorry, stack, I plot it. Let's have a look at what we have. OK, <laughs> we have an error. Let's load it again. Okay. As we have several environmental uh, uh, ecogeographical variables, it takes a while. Okay. We start in plotting it, and as you can see here, I asked to plot an object. And you you are looking at what is doing is drawing all the uh, ecogeographical variables that uh, we created. Okay. The first one, stack one, is the digital elevation model. Then we have <coughs> the the aspect part. So. Uh, north, uh, northeast, and, and so on. Okay. Uh, of course, uh, from uh, such a small uh, images, uh, you cannot maybe uh, get all the differences, but uh, believe me, they are different. Okay. And as you can see, all the variables, and you look at the uh, on the right of each uh, plot, 
uh, you can see that all the variable goes from zero to one because what we did actually is to get the proportion of each variable in each cell, okay? So uh, Damiano showed you a, a, an example about this uh, yesterday. You can actually create your stack, okay? Your set of ecogeographical variables depending on uh, which variable you and which covariate you think are useful to perform your distribution model, okay? Uh, da, Damiano on Tuesday uh, showed you also, for example, uh, um, uh, climatic variables uh, uh, that he got from WarClim. Uh, I don't know if you remember Bio 1, Bio 2, Bio 3, the minimum temperature, the maximum temperature, the average temperature, the uh, seasonal uh, uh, rain or whatever, okay? Um, I didn't load it, all of them, because we didn't have time, but once you know how to perform uh, and to prepare uh, your variable on one variable or two variables, so let's, uh, let's try it with at least two or three. Remember what I, I told you before, you can prepare all your data set, just testing a, in a smaller area, a, maybe also with a subset of ecogeographical variables, okay? So uh, uh, at this time, uh, I didn't use all those variables, uh, all those climatic variables, but we could just download it on our uh, computer, fix them as we did it with the, uh, uh, the digital elevation model. So we uh, project and fix the resolution of our variable, and then we can just pile them all together <coughs> and create our stack, okay? Remember that it is very easy uh, to work with, with a lot of variables, but we must remember that we should know what we are doing. Uh, uh, and so it, it would be better to uh, to do a selection of the variable, the ecogeographical variables before we start, uh, we start uh, performing our analysis. Okay. Uh, so we started with a uh, digital elevation model and the right and the derived uh, uh, raster aspect slow. Then we can load the uh, land cover. Actually, Sukulum sent to me, uh, uh, let's have a look and let's pass again to the uh, GIS. Let me see uh, if I found it. The ecosystem uh, uh, environmental variables. Uh, uh, but they, they were uh, a bit too, uh, they, they, um, I, um, they didn't cover all the area of the presence point. So I went to the Copernicus project. You can go easily on the, uh, on the, uh, on the web. Uh, you can find, let me see if I can find it over here. And I loaded, okay, uh, these uh, land cover variables. Okay, actually uh, these are pretty, uh, simple. This is a pretty simple like, cover, but that covers all the world, okay? And uh, uh, I use these uh, two raster. As, as you can see, I could uh, download uh, different parts of the world uh, in different sets. So these are two different sets. So we have on the hard drive two, two different raster layer, okay? I use this land cover data set to create uh, our geographical, ecogeographical variable. Okay, let's go back here. Here I loaded uh, the raster one, raster two. Okay, and uh, I, I didn't want to work with two different raster. I wanted just one raster for my uh, land cover 
uh, data set, okay? So what you can do in R is just to show you the possibility that you have, you can merge to different raster files, okay? Then what I did uh, was to write the uh, merge raster to the to the R drive. So anytime I need it, I have a, a, a unique raster layer for my uh, land cover analysis. Okay, so I created all these. Okay, and then I, I wrote it on the on the hard drive. And then I'm not running this, but you can try when I will send you the scripts. And now I just load this file. Okay, then again, what we do every time we work on eco, uh, eco geographical variable, okay, we project the raster. Okay, so we go again, uh, we, we set again the raster, we, uh, we load it to our reference raster. Okay, so everything is exactly uh, in the same uh, extension, same uh, resolution, okay. In the same dimension. Then uh, I I create uh, a, as you can see here. Actually, we have uh, a, on the on the plus part of our studio. So on the bottom on the right, uh, uh, we we don't have the proper name of all the variables. So you can always set the name of an object. Okay, we saw this part in. Uh, last week, uh, so we concatenate here, for example, line 138, uh, we create a vector of names, and actually, as you can see, are shrubs, herbaceous vegetation, cropland, urban, bare sparse vegetation, and so on, are the name of the link cover that we saw here on the uh, QGIS program project, okay? I give the, to the uh, uh, to the stack object uh, the name the proper name and then what I do again I filter my uh, uh, sorry I filter uh, my uh, my stack and uh, I create again ecogeographical variables that are, that are a proportion of, okay, a proportion of forest area in the cell of my raster grid, a proportion of bare soil, a proportion of urban area, okay, in, uh, in our uh, cell, okay? So let's, let's see, okay. I just I'm just checking that everything is in the proper way. I will try to plot the land cover stack that I create here. I'm not writing on the uh, uh, on the hard drive because I already did it. Okay, so let's have a look if it makes sense. Uh, anytime I do a step of my script, uh, I want to see, as I go step by step, I want to see what happens. Okay? And I, I do like to plot them. It maybe takes some time, but I want to have a look of what I did. So I can understand if I can go on or not. Okay? I plot this file. Okay? And if, as you can see, over in, in the plot part of the R Studio, let's have a look in a bigger way, we created a stack, okay, with the percentage of every single land cover coverage, shrubs, herbaceous, cropland, urban, and so on. 
as you can see from here, uh, uh, we, we can already understand that we got really few shrubs, vegetation. Most of the area is herbaceous, uh, herbaceous vegetation or bare special uh, vegetation. Uh, we got probably forest, okay, uh, only at the north part of our study area, of course, where we go up also with the uh, elevation, okay, uh, and and so on. We, we we got some some permanent water bodies over here. Let's think about it because uh, we will see this. We create some problem later on, okay. Uh, again, we uh, 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 what we do, okay. Once we prepare our land cover, what we do, we stack our land cover. We add our land cover to the previous ecogeographical variables that we create. OK. OK. Let me. OK, in uh, I run actually line 154 okay i wanted to add uh, our land cover stack to uh, the previous ecogeographical variable stack with digital elevation model uh, slopes and aspect but as you can see the, at the bottom in the console i got an error okay and the error is compare raster different stand okay because now when i load it again the, I create, sorry, be, um, uh, earlier the uh, the stack with the digital elevation model and the other variable. I didn't project that stack. So it means they are in a different extent. And when you try to pile them, to add all them together, actually R tells you, okay, but you cannot put them together because because probably one has got a projection that is different from the other one. So it's not a perfect pile and you cannot work on them. Okay. So so now what I had to do it, it was to run the uh, the line 151. Okay. Uh, it actually will take a a few minutes. So I I run some uh, some lines, so I I had to rerun something else, and we have to project our uh, land cover variable. Once we 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 did it, okay, we can add them all together. So before we had uh, like uh, 13 variables, so slope, aspect, and digital elevation model. And now we add all the land cover variables. So we have al a already a very um, big uh, data set for our cover rates. OK, so do you think that all of them are useful? And uh, the four things that we'll do later, OK, uh, will be uh, to check uh, if there is any correlation between these variables. Okay, uh, most of the times, uh, uh, for example, uh, elevation is strictly correlated in some in mountains with uh, forest cover, or not maybe, or uh, 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 let's say that elevation it could be correlated with uh, urban environments. Uh, I, I I would imagine that uh, at higher elevation I do not have uh, 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 settlements or villages or cities or anything like that. So probably uh, increasing elevation it means that we um, we do have a negative correlation with urban. Do we need to use both of the of these uh, covariates for our modeling? Probably we do. Uh, we do need because they actually tell us something different. But if we find any kind of correlation that we think is not, uh, uh, um, uh, it allows us, to under, allows us to understand that uh, our covariates gives us the same information, we can uh, 
take out from our analysis uh, this part uh, or the one of the one of the two uh, ecogeographical variables okay because we should remember that actually uh, when we use a lot of covariates in any kind of modeling okay it's not just on distribution modeling but in is uh, in any kind of modeling uh, we uh, we we should try to use only the usable covariates. We, we can test anything, maybe 100 covariates, but most of the time it's not useful looking at the biological or the natural part of above question, okay? So we, we must uh, think about our question at the beginning and already perform a filter, a selection of uh, covariates that we use in our modeling. Okay, as uh, I told you, it's taking ages, as you can see on the uh, bottom of uh, uh, left of the console. Uh, the, this uh, line, this uh, function is still running. Okay, it's taking quite a, uh, a, a lot of time. Um, because I'm running also Teams, so that's why my computer is, uh, the memory of my computer is uh, uh, almost full. I will stop this processing, I will start again because uh, I already loaded all this data. Uh, I will show you only the, the last part of the, uh, of, of the script that I will give to you. Of course, when uh, I prepare all my data set, okay, what I do is again what I, uh, I already told you. I as is it takes a lot of times. I write it on my hard drive. You can see this part on line 161. Okay, we can name our uh, uh, our land cover as we prefer. Okay, okay. Let me stop. Sorry, just a second. This part. Okay, uh, so we created our uh, data set, okay, for ecogeographical variable. Do you remember Damiano sketch? Okay, let's have a look at Damiano sketch here. So we perform the uh, orange part, the right part of the sketch. Uh, we already did a, also a part of the blue one, so we already define our area of interest. Okay, now we have to, perf uh, to load the presence data. Okay, what I do here is to go to pass to a next script, the second one, you will have also this one. Okay, and what I do here is to load the uh, with a function uh, read OGR that allows you to work with S3 shape file. Remember about that? Okay, I load this part. Okay, if you look what it tells me, okay, uh, it, uh, when loading it, uh, it tells me that is an S3 shape file. If you look at the console, where we where is loading it from? on the my hard drive, this is the uh, folder where I store the, the data. Uh, we got actually uh, quite a lot of uh, red deer presences, almost 2000, okay? And as we saw before, uh, we go uh, an attribute table with four fields, okay? If we go here again, uh, on the QGIS and we look at the attribute table, here we can see that our red deer presence has got four different fields that are two for the coordinates, latitude and longitude, and then the species uh, indicator that is uh, Cervus Selafus, and then a, an ID, okay? So if we go back to our R Studio, uh, here loading it, it tells already us that he has got uh, um, four, uh, uh, four fields, okay? Then there is also a warning message, 
Remember that warning is different from errors. It means that uh, R has been able to perform the function you asked to perform to it, okay? Uh, but something wasn't properly managed, so it actually tells us uh, what happens. Uh, it actually tells us that for some point, what we got, the coordinates weren't were not in the proper format, so weren't feeling going in the same extension we need and the same projection. So he uh, are dis discharge this. Uh, uh, few data, okay? But again, I want to see uh, in the, in the um, I want to make sure that my data are my presence data actually now are in the same projection in the same extent of the ecogeographical variable, okay? So in line 17, what I do okay, is uh, to project, okay, not the raster now, but the S3 shapefile that is in R, as I told you, is a spatial poly, spatial in this case, you can see a, in the, at the top of the right, uh, the, the object we create, the dear object, okay, that we just loaded is a spatial points data frame, okay, when we loaded before the study area, we had a spatial polygon data frame. In this case, we have presence points and we have a spatial points data frame. And to uh, transform this uh, uh, and project this uh, this kind of uh, of cl this class of object uh, of um, spatial points or spatial polygons or spatial line. Uh, we use the function sp transform that you can see in line 17. So what we tell to uh, uh, this function that we want to transform dear object that we just loaded at line 15 and to project it with the current with the correct uh, sorry uh, EPSG using the object CR CRS that we created before. Okay, so we project the our object. As you can see here, I uh, assign this function, the results of this function to an object with the same name of the object I created before. So remember, you can do uh, uh, working in R in a different way. You can uh, overwrite as I did in this case the same object with something else or you can do step by step and create for example the object uh, dear number one dear two dear three dear four so you can store in your environment uh, all the steps okay in this case uh, I think uh, it wasn't so useful okay so I prefer to overwrite but when you start, you work on it, and anytime you, um, for example, here you, you saw that loading the dear presence was very fast, maybe one, a couple of seconds, okay, not more. So I do not mind if I have to load it again, okay, for me it's not a problem. Instead, for example, loading raster or grid uh, file, it becomes uh, uh, um, more time demanding. So uh, maybe it's better to store a, a process object in a different object, okay? So I would give a different name. In this case, I didn't. Again, I want to see what I have with me, okay? So I plot the dear object. Let's have a look what we have here in the uh, plot page. Okay, if we look at it, okay, and and uh, it, it's pretty easy because uh, uh, to understand if you are if we have the the right information with us because if you look at the bottom of this graph, 
on this diagram, there are two points over here. There are two strange points that are pretty far from the uh, from the other uh, presence points. If we go to the to our uh, QGIS programs, you can see that actually we got two points on the southern part of Mongolia over here. Okay, so it, it, of course uh, 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 we are not really sure that it is exactly the same file, but we are confident that we are working on the same thing. Okay, and then uh, here I left a line number 18 that is uh, 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 a comment. A minimal conditioning is needed. Okay. If you have, as I told you before, here is the moment of our sketch. Okay. Here, where you clean your distribution data. Okay. So, is there anything wrong? For example, these two points are these two presence points in the south part are correct, or maybe uh, they are not. This is the, the first thing I thought about it. Uh, something different. Uh, uh, for example, if we uh, the uh, the year of the collection of this uh, presence, uh, maybe the older the older presences, for example, of 30 years ago are not still useful to uh, perform a distribution, a potential distribution model, okay? Because probably deers are not there anymore. <coughs> you can make any filter you want or it here, okay? And how you can filter? You can filter this part. Uh, uh, exactly as you filter a data frame, okay? So if you remember what we did uh, uh, the first week, okay? Um, we used, uh, for example, the square brackets. You can perform filtering and selection uh, in, the, in the same way you do it uh, with the data frame, okay? As you can see, we spent most of our lesson trying to prepare our data set, okay? So one hour and a half. So it means that uh, the proportion of time we need to perform our modeling, as usual, goes in preparing in the correct way our data, okay? Then I create, uh, uh, if we look at the top of the left, a, another script that uh, um, has got anything together. Okay, I uh, I merge the first and the second script. Okay, and here actually we start the modeling part. Okay, so we will see what uh, a bit of modeling, how we perform it. Okay, and that we see some results as Damiano showed you yesterday. Okay, again, at the top of the, uh, uh, of the script, the first steps are loading and preparing uh, our desktop. Okay, we can run. Everything here, I get uh, again what we already prepared. Okay, before. Okay, I load again uh, the data. Okay. What did Damiano told you yesterday that is very important for Maxent modeling? Okay, that we can work with presences. Okay, but actually to understand where uh, the distribution of the species, we should know also the absences. Okay. So what uh, um, 
uh, what you can do to create absences. Actually, in, uh, uh, in R, with a very simple function, you can see it at line number uh, 61, okay? You can create random points. Damiano told you this yesterday, okay? So you work with presence and you generate background data, okay? That are like uh, uh, absences for us, okay? How many? We can uh, how many random data for background points we, we we can generate as much as we want okay so uh, we give uh, to uh, to the function random points uh, if you look at like line 61 61 sorry uh, our steady area you say that you want uh, 10,000 background points. You can, you can write anything you want. Of course, uh, usually uh, you, you should have a look of what you need to create. Uh, I, I create 10,000 uh, background point because is the, the most uh, uh, used number performing Maxent modeling. But if you are doing any other kind of modeling, you can, uh, choose a different number of the ground points and also if you are still running a maxent uh, a maxent modeling uh, you can adjust this number to what you need okay so we create this part uh, a background okay if you look at the top of the right in the environment part we have an object BKG, okay, there is a numeric project with uh, 10,000 lines and two, uh, uh, two different columns. As you can see here, we resum, uh, you can see the number of coordinates, okay? Then what we do uh, as an, as first step uh, performing analysis. As I said before, uh, we can choose our uh, ecogeographical variables. We can do it because we know what we want. So I choose the uh, uh, forest habitat. I don't want to use, for example, the uh, water body habitat because for, for example, for red deer, not useful. Or I can ask to R to find correlation. Okay, in this case, from line 64 to line 71, we calculate a, a, a VIF, okay, that allows us to select ecogeographical variables. Uh, what does VIF uh, uh, perform? Let me see if I am the VIF, okay. I run the VIF, okay, line 60, uh, 66, so I can have a look if there is any correlation within, uh, between our variables. Okay, sorry for taking some time, but uh, when I test it uh, yesterday, it was working in a faster but running everything in teams is getting a, a, a little bit uh, slower. Okay. Okay, while uh, uh, our console is running, is working on line 66. Let's have a look uh, uh, at the top of the, uh, uh, the top on the left of the, and, and let's see what we do in the, uh, in the other uh, commands, okay? From 67 to 71. As you can see in 67, okay, here is what we got. We performed the VIF uh, 
uh, in uh, the VIF uh, analysis. As you can see, I store my analysis uh, in line 66 in an object <coughs> called VIF core, that means VIF correlation. Let's have a look at this object. Okay, if you look at this object, uh, it tells us that we were working on 13 ecogeographical variables. Okay, and uh, it says that uh, there is a collinearity problem with uh, ecogeographical variables number 11. Okay, and uh, it tells us that uh, uh, after excluding the collinear variables, uh, it gives us uh, uh, the last set, okay? And here you can see which is uh, the, uh, the result of the analysis, okay? What I can do here is say, okay, uh, variable number 11, I don't, I don't remember which is the, the 11, uh, the name of the 11, Sorry, but later we will see the proper uh, the proper run of the distribution modeling. Uh, you can uh, we, we decide to remove this variable. So in line number 67, we exclude okay from the our eco eco geographical variable stack what we the result of the the VIF uh, analysis, and then we can go on and perform several. Uh, analysis. The, here we uh, in line number 69, I perform uh, another uh, VIF analysis, it's called VIF step, okay? It allows us to, again, to select, uh, to select uh, different variable and to test for collinearity, correlation for different variables, and so we can choose the proper one, okay? This is just a way to, uh, to move. Actually, uh, this part, I just use a VIF analysis. You can use the analysis you prefer. You can also decide that you don't want to do a further selection that you already performed, the selection you already uh, prepare only the useful variables, ecogeographical variables, so you don't need to um, to do to do to perform this selection or this analysis, but this useful um, take this as a suggestion for every kind of modeling. Okay, not just max extent modeling, not just distribution modeling, but also for other kind of analysis. Okay, when you have a lot a lot of covariates, this could be a way to reduce the number of your covariates. Uh, then I remove the object I created because I don't need them uh, anymore. Okay, and then for e from here I start working on what Damiano told you yesterday about Max and Molly. Okay, what I do here is a mass map. Okay, the first step is create a mass map. Do you remember what a mass map uh, will help you to? to work with, uh, a mass map allows you to understand if you project your distribution model, if you project in a proper way or in a um, or not in a correct way. OK, let's have a look at the uh, mass map here I already created. OK, let me see. Let me see if I can find you on the geographical information system over here. OK. OK, the first thing that we can see here, OK, is that the result that we have here on the mass map is the uh, pink to red uh, uh, image that we can see on the on the map uh, is not in the exactly same form, uh, shape of the uh, of our study area. Why is this? Because uh, when you work on raster, okay, you work on the extent of the raster and not exactly on the shape as you can do with polygons. So as you can see, uh, the western part 
uh, year it, it, it has with it, it fall on this angle here the same for the northernmost part for the southernmost part and easternmost part okay the mass map uh, tells us where we can be confident with uh, our modeling uh, depending on the presence point okay as you can see here with the pink part it means that uh, we are confident if we project our our model over there uh, okay uh, instead in the most uh, red part of our mass part mass map if we look over here we are not so confident okay if you think about it most of the presence points are in a flat part um, you of course know know this area better than me okay but for me looking at here it makes sense we don't have uh, points presence points of the red deer a tire elevation in the mountains i'm just uh, 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 making this thought uh, looking at the map maybe it's not like this but this is the uh, what, what i think is happening okay um, so if you want to project uh, our distribution model over this elevation probably the results that we get is not so correct okay so we must be careful when we project uh, the information our model okay as our model is the result of a function as uh, damiano show you yesterday the present points are a function okay of the, all the ecogeographical variables all together okay we could actually project our distribution model all over the world okay but of course our presence point uh, uh, are not sample in any kind of habitat okay so our uh, distribution model will not be uh, um, correct uh, very far from our presence point okay this is the meaning of the mass map okay let's go back to let's go back here to uh, uh, to to the to the R studio in these three lines actually we perform the math map uh, at line 87 we extract uh, extract what does it mean actually that uh, uh, passing the ecogeographical variable that we prepared before uh, all the uh, species presence uh, we, we we can get where, where they fall where they falls okay so we extract the variable of the ecogeographical uh, uh, we, we extract the value, sorry, of the ecogeographical variables where we have the, uh, the presence points. From that, we create the mass map. We already seen the results, okay? And then I, in line 92, I wrote it on the R drive. And the mass map is the one we saw exactly now in the, uh, right now in the QGIS, okay? And then here we arrive to the uh, analysis and to the maxed model okay how many lines we brought today 100 200 lines to arrive till here when we want to perform max modeling it's just line number seven 97 sorry okay max and modeling in uh, this mod package uh, you can perform it using max and function okay and what you have to do with which arguments you have to pass to the max and function okay the ecogeographical variables the presence point okay where you want to store your uh, uh, your model and some other uh, arguments that you can easily find asking to uh, looking at the Maxton uh, manual page, okay. I'm I'm not running this uh, this line because it takes quite a, uh, a few times, 
you can ask also to replicate these uh, all the times you want. Okay? So within the arguments, uh, you, you can say also, as Damiano told you on Tuesday, how many um, points you can use to run your distribution model and to test your distribution model. The jackknife analysis, do you remember about it? So you use a subset of your data set to run the model, and then you use the presence points you left in the other subset to test if they falls inside your distribution, uh, potential distribution area, okay? So you test if you are doing a, a, a proper uh, a proper analysis, okay? The other things you have to do, remember that this is uh, just a function, okay? The function that gives you, uh, which is, uh, uh, we are, which are the coefficient of every single ecogeographical uh, variable you use to perform uh, your modeling. Then what you have to do, you have to predict to project your model, okay? Because you in here, a line number 97, you have numbers, okay? Okay, I will show you what you have. In line, in line number 97. <coughs> okay, let's have a look. I already saved the results on my hard drive. In the folder models. Okay. If I have a look here. Okay, I see a lot of uh, uh, a lot of, of graphs, okay, or diagram, okay. Anything you perform, uh, Maxent will store in the folder you ask it uh, to uh, to store it, so you can have all the information. And uh, if we have a look, let's see over here. He sum up everything in a single file, HTML file, okay, called exactly as we, uh, a Max Sentaka HTML file. If you open it with a, any browser, you can have the results of your, of your model. As we will see here, we are almost at the end. Here, we, we, we can see what Damiano showed you yesterday, but we cannot see any map of it. We want to to get the map, okay? This is the first step of the, of the model processing, okay? This is the uh, sensitivity versus specificity uh, diagram that uh, Damiano showed you yesterday. And as far, as much far we are from the, um, from the black line, better it is our predic prediction. Okay, if you look at the red and the blue line, you can see that we got a AUC value, okay, uh, higher than 0 0.7, so it's almost 0 0.9 and over 0 0.8, okay? So we can say that we are confident we are our modeling, we can trust what we did, okay? Then Damiano yesterday showed different parts of this uh, output of Maxent model. What I want to show you uh, here is the uh, Maxent also gives you the influence uh, uh, of each ecogeographical variable to your distribution. Okay. If we look at the uh, here you can see cropland, okay? In the land cover, I use percentage of copper or cropland. Uh, and when you see a flat line like this, it means that uh, this variable is not useful at all to predict the, uh, the present distribution. It means that from zero probability of present to one probability of presence, your variable 
behave always in the same way. So there is no reason to use again in uh, our future modeling the cropland land cover habitat. Okay, this is true also for, for example, for this uh, aspect northwest. But for example, uh, we can see that uh, uh, the northeast uh, variable covariates that we pass to max and modeling uh, increase, increasing the probability of presence. So closer we go to the to the northeast variable, higher we, we have the probability of presence of the of, of our species. Okay. For example, these are increasing uh, uh, southern slope, uh, southern aspect is decreasing. For example, urban is not important at all. But if you remember when we were looking at the at the uh, land cover uh, preparation, uh, we we had a, a really few part with the urban uh, land cover variable and. Uh, um, as you can see here, I would say also that uh, uh, open forests are very important for uh, uh, for uh, probability distribution of the species. As you can see, it, it increased quite a lot. So you can do a lot of, uh, uh, of course, you have to learn a bit about Maxent and the output. I uh, cannot give you all the information today, uh, but uh, with uh, the scripts uh, I will send you and with the lesson that Damiano uh, did to you last time, you can uh, have an uh, uh, instrument to learn what uh, you can read over here. Okay? So, uh, uh, we can see which is the uh, contribution of each variable to the distribution, uh, uh, potential distribution. Here in this uh, table, you can see that the elevation, bare space, vegetation, closed forest, uh, deciduous and evergreen forest uh, are important. But there are a lot of, a lot of variables that do not have any, do not give us any information to perform distribution modeling of these species. So actually, what I would do, I would try to test a, a, another um, Maxent model, but I would remove all these variables, okay? All the ones you, you, you see at the bottom of the table, okay? So you you can you can remove from that, okay? You can see what you see in the table here, also uh, with the uh, with, with with this diagram, okay? There are several diagram, okay? And then let's go back to R, okay? What we do? We use those information. They are that are functions. As you, as you saw, okay, in the diagram, functions and uh, coefficient for every ecogeographical variables, and we predict the distribution, okay, and then we save the distribution, okay. What we do, what we have, let's have a look here, okay, the results, okay, now. Is something like that. Let me see. This is the uh, the pink uh, uh, in the pink. The distribution model actually. The, our maxent model of the presence of deer is the pink one that you violet as you see here in the uh, in the map. Okay. Uh, and this is the area of <coughs> presence potential presence of the species. Starting from what? For, from the presence point you sent to me, Suchulum sent to me, and the ecogeographical vari variable that we choose. Okay. I was looking at this uh, distribution, okay, now, uh, uh, trying to understand if it makes sense or not, actually. Then I was going around here, and what I saw is that uh, 
the distribution model predict the presence of the deer also inside this lake. Okay, I would say, okay, I can imagine that the red deer can swim, but they would not stay all the time inside the, the, uh, the lake. And then I had the look also on other lakes. So I said, okay, maybe something went wrong. I don't want a distribution model that tells me that red deer can be in the lake because we know it's not correct, okay? But if you look at the presence data, actually we have quite few uh, in the orange, the orange points. Actually here we have quite few present points inside the lake, okay? I don't know if I did uh, uh, a wrong projection of the presence points that Switzerland sent to me, or probably these are errors that uh, we had uh, uh, collecting data set, okay? Do you remember when I told you we must uh, select and filter all the presence point? Okay, what I would do now is to check all the point, to select this one, remove these from uh, these points from that falls in the lakes from data set and perform again the modeling, okay? As we are, we stored, uh, we wrote everything in our script, we just need to change to filter the present points and then just run our script and create our new model, okay? We are at the end of the, uh, of the lesson. Uh, I've been talking for almost two hours. <laughs> I'm sorry, I hope you are all still alive. I know that it's not easy. Uh, to to understand this, but I will send you the scripts and the presence points and the ecogeographical variables, so you can try and perform this uh, on your uh, on uh, your computer. Okay, so we learned that in Mongolia, red deer uh, stay in lakes. Actually, uh, is the new part of for my. Uh, biological information background. Uh, anyway, uh, if you have any question, you can type it in the chat or just ask. And uh, uh, as soon as we close the lesson, I will send you all. We load all the materials in the uh, in the folder that Namiano created for us. Thank you, Francesco, for uh, this uh, uh, thick, uh, dense two hours. Uh, I hope that having uh, split the theory and the reasoning behind the modeling the exercise and the modeling exercise itself, how me and Francesco have made in these two last uh, afternoons, uh, we mm, had been uh, convenient for you to understand how uh, things goes. Anyway, as you as you have seen, uh, we, we've made it uh, co uh, consciously, uh, and now the problem in Mongolia to, to manage red deer is either to uh, get those lakes dry definitely, or <laughs> that's better uh, check and recheck data. Uh, is no one's fault. Uh, be be warned of this. Uh, it happens uh, because it takes time different persons, different uh, uh, ways of uh, collecting the coordinates and whatever. So you can get wrong. Uh, I don't know if Francesco remember that. It happened to me um, two years ago, the last one. We were working on the Apennine bear, the Marsican uh, brown bear, who is an, um, an endemic uh, species we have in central Italy, is near, uh, really near extinction. We have uh, less than uh, 60 animals, uh, 57 if I remember correctly, and uh, we were making a modeling exercise because uh, most uh, animals of all, if I remember, have a GPS collar, and one of those animals was uh, uh, in the Gulf of Guinea, south of uh, Africa. <laughs> Why? Because the uh, north coordinate was wrong, uh, and the computer read that coordinate at zero which is, if you remember, the equator. So, things happen. Don't be worried about that. Questions?
Professor Damian and Francesca, thank you very much for very valuable information and training. The, in the picture, I saw that the most southern point is uh, somehow a mistake. This is near the in the uh, the little north of this point is okay. The, there is some reintroduction of the deer still in the program, and uh, in the western part is okay. okay. But in this map, we also did, uh, didn't see. We have some more distribution in the eastern Mongolia, exactly in east, directly in east, in east, southeastern area also have. There is no forest in the south, especially in the southeastern area. There is no uh, forest, but they live in, in the hill sites oh, somehow. Okay. okay. So and the number is uh, increasing in uh, in recent years. The years in the whole Mongolia. Country. So I, I saw from in the your analysis in the Maxent and the Kujas in R uh, they are very uh, nice. So I understand that the powerful of the R programming doing almost everything and good cooperating the other programs somehow. The Maxent in something it's very good in the I think um, our guys understand some information from your training, uh, some new, they can, uh, I hope they did, can discover something for themselves. And maybe we are, because we are some in a deep, different level of the understanding of R. Some is a good understanding the steps from one step to another step, somehow they catch something, I, I think. So very, uh, Nice uh, training we had from you guys, and really thank you for this. Thank you to you for your invitation. It's been a, a, a pleasure. As I said at the beginning of the uh, of the lessons, uh, uh, we we wanted to give you some instrument to understand the powerful, as you just said, of the instrument of, of R and the calculation. I we perfectly know that. Uh, uh, you will not learn R just you do you, during these four classes, but yeah. you will need to spend some time, and uh, your students will need to spend some time on that. And uh, if you need any help uh, for other things, uh, you can just type us and write by mail, so we can uh, we we can help you. Yeah, it's very really good. Uh, not only for for. For this, for this uh, training, we also have uh, now we have some contacts with you, and the people if they are interested or if didn't understand something for their uh, analysis, they would contact you, and it's uh, would be very good cooperation in the future. And you also, uh, uh, if you have some good chance to opportunity, also came to Mongolia and uh, welcome and visit somehow in the future. Really? I would like to, I would like to come. Yeah. We will find a way. <laughs> uh -huh. Okay. So it's, oh. it's really, it's really happening. This is the end of the course, but perhaps the beginning of something more, uh, more useful and lasting, I hope. So, uh, any other questions? If there are no follow questions, I will uh, wish you a nice evening and don't uh, don't hesitate mailing Francesco and me, me and Francesco, should you uh, find the time to try replicating uh, some modeling exercise. We are here so that, that the learning uh, process has just started. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, everyone. Um, very happy for this class to happen, and uh, we'll get in touch. Okay. Bye bye. Good evening, everyone. Thank you.